Okay, let's go live. So probably we are live at YouTube right now, Alberto. Let's, okay. Let me share me. Yeah. So great. Should be yeah. So I see your face on YouTube. <laughs> okay, good. All right. I'm just uh you know, so it's gonna be it's gonna start in 15 minutes. So mm -hmm. what we can do, Alberto. Um yeah, maybe you can share your screen and yep. uh, you can pull up your presentation. Maybe we 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 leave the title in the in yep. the window just so as soon people as, as soon people are, are get into the the channel, they can see you know we are online already. Mm -hmm. um, do you have my cell phone number? I do. Let me. I, I have an old one. I'm gonna text you. I'm not gonna. Mention the numbers here because we are live on Facebook. Yeah, uh, and just um, in, in case my connection drops out, since I don't have a video feedback of anyone, um, if the connection drops out, just send me a text, okay? Okay, so your your cell phone didn't change since 2016, no. I guess, right? Mm -hmm. So I should have you here, Alberto. Can you see my slide? Yes, I can see it. And can you so see my picture to... moving? Yeah, I do see it. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, let me do. So I have to. Um... Or you can actually even just send me an email, honestly. It's just the email might take a little longer. Yeah, let me. I thought I had I had uh, you on. Uh, I'll send it to you on WhatsApp. But yeah, just send me on your on my email, and then. Okay. How are things going there? Oh, very good, Alberto. I mean, we are stuck. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we, we are. Very good, Alberto. We are, I, I, I'm actually, I have another computer on YouTube, so we have a little delay. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are stuck from, uh, I mean, it's been almost six months already, right? So it started on, on middle of March and um, yeah, I mean, this has been crazy five, six months because basically, you know, the numbers uh, of death and, uh, and cases of, of, of the COVID-19 in Brazil uh, increased and then tapered and, and it's not going down, right? So mm -hmm. we have a wonderful president that thinks nothing is uh, very dangerous and, you know, so the situation is, is not getting better. And we don't know how it's going to be in the next few months. So it's very hard to, you know, uh, with, with students and, 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 and most of the students, many of the students are finalizing their theses and they cannot go, you know, to the lab. Right. Uh, the lectures are all being given online, which is okay. But for most of the laboratories, like teaching labs, it's mm -hmm. more difficult to handle. Right. So, you know, uh, it, in the beginning it was okay, but now after five, six months, it's it's getting a little bit stressful, to be honest. But yeah. I think it's all over the place, right? I, I, I just read that uh, the, case, the number of cases in Europe is increasing as well, maybe the second mm -hmm. wave or something like that. Uh, yeah, it's very country yeah. dependent. Yeah, so here um, our, our lockdown started March 16th, and just this week, they announced that they might reopen all the shops, uh, not quite normally, but this is the first week that in San Francisco, they're saying that they're thinking about reopening. I mean, we had a, in June, so for until June, it was a pretty hard lockdown. And then from June on, they opened a few things, but like all restaurants have to be outdoors. Most shops are still closed. And now it's the, it's the first week that we're hearing that they might reopen the other shops and everything Classes are online until uh, for sure December. 
uh, likely longer. We don't know. We're going quarter by quarter. So it, it's, it's, it's been pretty tough here too. Um, my daughters are, uh, their school is online. It started two weeks ago and it's online, three weeks ago and it's online still. Um, and then now we have the fires. You, 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 of course, you can't uh, smell it or see it on the YouTube, but uh, here my garage smells like I'm in the middle of a barbecue because we have all the fires around. So even yeah, if you uh, go out, I've, I've, been, you I've been following through the news. It's a yeah, pretty tough year, right? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I got a, a, a joke by WhatsApp where you see the number 13, you know, like a cartoon with a bubble that says, I'm the worst number. And then 666, <laughs> 666 says, oh, what? I'm much worse than you. And then you see 2020 and he goes, please. <laughs> Yeah, that's a crazy year. We have uh, also here, I mean, uh, uh, we have uh, a, uh, a draw weather here, dry weather, which mm -hmm. is also, you know, the numbers of humidity, at least in the region I live, it's below 15%, wow. which is also tough. Uh, and then you add this to, to the cases of COVID that also has implication on the breath system. Mm -hmm, right. So, you know, it, it gets all complicated, right? So, but yes. anyways, uh, I'm, I'm actually very happy to have you here, Alberto. It's, uh, it's some, sometimes good things happen and, and, yeah, and uh, we were forced to, to, to move our, our cycle of colloquium to, to, to the online. Um, uh, and then of course we could invite friends from, from all over the, the world. And uh, it's good to have you here. And again, thank you for waking up uh, six something, <laughs> maybe 5 a.m. in the morning just to be ready for, um, for this. I, so I can we, you that I'm wearing pants. So I, I did wake up a little earlier to get dressed. <laughs> <laughs> but you're having a coffee, right? No, because I couldn't wake up everyone to have a coffee. I'll have it once I'm done. I'm okay. So are you uh, going to, to Stanford campus, Alberto, or no. still? No, no, we're still not allowed. So, uh, well, I, I guess, um, yeah, technically faculty are not allowed. It's only if you, you have to justify why you go. So I am authorized. So if, if I go, the building doors will open. I have to do the health check and then I go. Um, the building doors were op would open and I could get to my office, but um, they keep track. So if I show up every day, I will get an email saying, remember that you're not allowed. So I can go into, let's say, pick up a book. I did that a couple of times. I pick up notes because I'm going to go, I'm going to start teaching in two weeks. Um, I dropped off a couple of things, but I can't go every day uh, to my office. They are starting a pilot plan for that with a few buildings. And uh, one of our buildings is in that pilot. So maybe next week. Um, faculty can go back if they want to, but but technically I can't. And then they they divided the campus into zones, um, so you're supposed you get a uh, you have to always show your Stanford ID and then you get a lanyard with a color, and you're supposed supposed to stay within the color coding of your lanyard. And campus police goes around and checks. So it's still pretty. I see. Safe. I see. Yeah, so I think it, we are pretty much in the, the same situation. So we stopped in uh, 17th of March. Mm -hmm. So you, you guys stopped it one day before, I guess, but we are still in the same situation. We have a, you know, a plan to, you know, return to normal plan kind of thing. Right. Uh, also divide in colors and, and we are in like orange, mm -hmm. which is you know, the second worst. So we, we can only go for, you know, very specific activities like, you know, replacing helium liquid in magnets and stuff like that, right? So something uh, really ne necessary happens, you right. can go. In the library, you can uh, talk to the ladies through WhatsApp mm -hmm. and then uh, they will pick up the books and then uh, you just go and withdraw them. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it's been... I'm also lecturing uh, a very interesting uh, subject. It's the first time it's been offered is the physics of materials. So I thought about sending you a message because I know you have a lot of materials on, 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 on that vertical. So maybe- oh, yeah, I, I guess one day. Two seconds. 
I think you dropped out for a second. What are you teaching? So am I back? Yeah, you are. Okay. Now I'm teaching this course, uh, Physics of Materials, uh -huh. which is basically applying, you know, uh, physics theory to explain phenomena in materials, right? And uh, mm -hmm. I, I thought about, you know, getting in touch with you because I, I'm pretty sure I have a lot of materials on this. Uh, so maybe one day we can jump on on a, on a Skype and talk a little bit. Maybe you, know, you can give me some hints. Actually, our, uh, um, you know what? I'm going to um, go on my hotspot off my phone. That works better. Just give me a second. Sure. Okay. Am I back? Yep. You're okay. Right. You're good. It, it turns out we have a, a new faculty who's Brazilian and he teaches our um, a, a class on the theory of uh, materials. So he might be a good person to get in touch with as well. Oh, really? Yeah. What is his name? Um, uh, Felipe da Jornada. Okay, that's good. He's, uh, is he on the material science department? Already? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, that's awesome. He just started in January. No, sorry, in September. That's fantastic. Yeah. No, sorry, he started in January. I'm wrong. Yeah, he started in January. Yeah, he was doing a, um, a I think he did a PhD and then a postdoc uh, in Berkeley. Uh, in which field, Alberto? And he was in physics in Berkeley. He did his um, uh, PhD with um, Stephen Louis, who was a materials physicist. At the the physics department. That's good. That's awesome. You know, maybe when all this is over, I can go for a few few weeks to yeah, visit you. And of course, the invitation is always for you to come here. Uh, yeah. But then I can, you know, see the old friends and make new friends as well. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, do you know anything about? Um, the fall MRS, Alberto, it's it's canceled, right? It's online, yeah. yeah. It's gonna be all online, right? Mm -hmm. and, and and the spring in April is also is also I, canceled, right? Or have they, they, have they announced something about the spring one? I don't know. Yeah, I, I'm not following as well. I, mean, I haven't seen an announcement about the spring. The fall for sure. Um, the spring, I, I don't even remember where it was supposed to be. Um, whether it was supposed to be in Phoenix or in Seattle, maybe in Seattle. Yeah, I haven't followed that. So I'm actually using my tablet. So Alberto, we have more three minutes or mm -hmm. or so. So let's just uh, start on time, okay? Yep. Well, this conversation is being broadcasted, so I know, I know, but I, I, that's fine. <laughs> so it's just uh, just so we don't leave an empty room. People realize we are online already. Absolutely. But I'm I'm just fighting you. How, how are you going to handle the questions? Yeah, the questions are going to be posted on uh, on the YouTube chat. Mm -hmm. So then I can read it for you. Okay. Okay. Because right, yeah. I won't see them. Yeah, no problem. So that's that's something I'm trying to uh, to troubleshoot here because I, I cannot see the questions some or the chat. But I will do it uh, and I will figure it out. No mm -hmm. problem. So Alberto, let me do a test quickly before we start. Can you yeah. put on presentation mode? And, and say something just, just so I make sure your presentation is going to be full, full screen and your uh, face it's is going to be it's, on the top. It's not full screen now. No, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's just the PowerPoint open in a way you can edit the slide. So it's, it's oh, not on presentation okay. mode. Oh, that's weird. Oh, now I see your entire face only. Yeah, I stopped sharing. Um, oh, okay. That's odd supposed to be in presentation mode. Okay, let's try this now. Oh, I know what I did. OK. 
Okay. How is this? Oh, that's perfect. So let me, let just wait. Because we have a small little delay on the broadcasting. Let me see how, how it goes on. Yeah, can, can you say something, Alberto? Yeah, uh, hi everyone. How did that work out? I think it's good. Let me ask my friend here. It's my first time doing this, Alberto. So, <laughs> uh, okay. He says, I have a, you know, a coworker that organizes the colloquium with me. So okay. we share the activities. Um, so he hosts the former, uh, invitee and I'm hosting you today. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we have this uh, WhatsApp uh, room where we exchange some, some information. So he says, is everything all right? Perfect. Okay, good. So maybe Alberto, mm -hmm. uh, so it's uh, 10.30. 10 mm -hmm. Let's give one more minute just so, you know, yep. I have problems connecting, so sometimes people have problems. So let me just wait one, one or two minutes and then we get started. Just mm -hmm. to make it in time. And, uh, and you said the YouTube feed is delayed by a, a couple of seconds or so, or it's... Uh, yeah, surprised. like uh, one or two seconds. So, you know, I, I see because I have two computers here. Uh, one is actually hooked up to the Zoom and the other one is, is in the broadcast. Okay. So whatever you do, it takes like two or three seconds for me to see the same action on YouTube. Okay. So it's just a small little delay. It's not, it's not anything big. You know, Zoom works pretty well, actually. Yeah. I'm actually quite uh, amazed about, you know, yeah. they have all these, um, uh, you know, interfaces with Facebook, YouTube, well, yeah, it's the first time other... actually I, I get uh, broadcasts on YouTube. I didn't know that it had a, an interface with YouTube that was uh, so easy to use. Yeah, it's meetings. really, really easy. Yeah. I have meetings with all sorts of other tools. Some universities use really, WebEx. Really easy. Yeah. But yeah. Zoom is definitely the best one. So I'm, actually, I, I, got, I got your voice on my YouTube here. Um, Okay, Alberto, so I think we have almost 100 people waiting online okay. with us. So I think it's about time mm -hmm. we, get, uh, we get started. So I'm going to start my video just so I make a presentation. Hey, Greg. And then, hey, how are you, Alberto? <laughs> and then I will give you the space here. So uh, thank you, Alberto. Thank everyone in, in, in this uh, virtual room. We appreciate everyone to come here on a Friday morning to enjoy this colloquium. Uh, it's actually a very great pleasure to welcome Professor Alberto Saleo. Alberto Saleo, um, it's not only you know a great scientist, uh, you know uh, a leader on material science slash physics and materials, but he was he's also a very good friend of ours. Uh, I, I get the chance to spend three years in his lab. As a postdoc was, you know, three wonderful days. I met wonderful people. I learned so much, and I'm always very grateful for that, Alberto. And uh, you know, besides being an awesome uh, scientist, Alberto is also a very pleasant person. He is a very good friend, um, and uh, we always we still collaborating. So um, it's very good to to keep this collaboration going on. And I guess this uh, symposium. It's part of this friendship that actually was created back in 2014, 2013. Uh, just so I give a brief uh, presentation on, on Alberto Salil's um, uh, career. He got his, P, uh, his degree in chemistry from the University of Rome in Italy. Uh, he received a master and a PhD in material science from uh, University of California, Berkeley. Uh, he worked with optical breakdown and fused silica. Uh, then he spent five years at the Palo Alto Research Center as a postdoc and then as a uh, member of the research uh, staff 
working mainly on electronic materials. In 20, 20, uh, 20, uh, 2005, 2005, sorry, he joined the Department of Material Science uh, and Engineering from Stanford University, where he is uh, a professor up to these days. Uh, he is also the department chair so I guess he's doing a lot of paperwork these days, but you know, this is part of the game, I guess. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so this is his, the top 1% most cited scientists in material science and all this uh, great stuff that he does. And he's gonna share a little bit about, you know, chart transport in conjugated polymers, the importance of order from atomic to local to mesoscale. So without further ado, Alberto, you know, thank you so much for waking up 5 slash 6 a.m. in Palo Alto or San Francisco. And, uh, you know, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. Thanks, Greg, for the invitation. It's great, it's great to see you in person. And uh, indeed, it's great to uh, continue with this friendship. Uh, so really, thank you for the invitation. Also, uh, cultivating my friendship with Greg uh, gives me continuous access to Brazilian coffee, which is always great. So um, thank you, I'm really grateful for this invitation and I'm really happy to be able to present to this audience. Um, I thought because I, uh, this is a physics department, I could give a talk sort of on some of the fundamental um, ideas behind how does charge transport work in conjugated polymers as charge transport is really needed uh, for pretty much every electronic application you can think of for these materials. And what we found over the years, this is really the bread and butter of the fundamental science part of uh, the research that we do in the group. What we found is order in the material is really important and order at all length scales matter for um, electrons and holes to be able to move quickly um, through these materials. So I will um, start actually with uh, acknowledgements. Um, in my group, this is work that's been going on over the years. So I have, I'm showing work from uh, a few of my students that have gone through the group over the years. So this is really something like almost 15 years uh, going on in the group. Um, I, we also do quite a bit of characterization at the synchrotron and we work a lot with Mike Tony at Slack and a staff scientist named Chris, Chris Takax. I will also show some great recent, well, the results are not recent, but we published them recently um, of work that uh, we did when uh, Gregorio was in the group and also with the help of Eduardo. Um, recently, we've been working quite a bit in electron microscopy and uh, that's done in collaboration with Andrew Miner, who is the director of um, the National Center for Electron Microscopy at Berkeley and is a professor in the material science department in Berkeley. And then um, finally, uh, materials and uh, the materials that I'll show come from uh, Rachel Siegelman, who is now at UC Santa Barbara, and uh, Ian McCullough, uh, who is at KAUST. So to start sort of broadly, uh, I'm in the material science department, and uh, this is my favorite uh, old cliche about material science from Sir Charles Frank, who was a very famous English material scientist during World War II, and then is one of the fathers of uh, modern English metallurgy. And the uh, cliche is that uh, materials are like people, it's defects in them that make them interesting. So when we think about characterizing these conjugated polymers and figure out how they work, we always have to keep in mind that defects will be really important. It turns out actually his real quote is crystals are like people, but everyone knows a perfect crystal is pretty boring and we're really interested in uh, materials more broadly. So the, the theme here will be really how do we study defects and what are the defects that matter in conjugated polymers. And uh, also uh, because the audience has students and uh, sometimes students um, space out, I actually like to put the conclusion first. And actually this slide maybe uh, is more of a personal reflection on the fact that I, as, as uh, Greg uh, showed from uh, my uh, sort of history, in research, I actually don't come from the world of polymers. I did my PhD in glasses. I really come more from the world of more conventional inorganic materials. So working in polymers was new for me. I never took a polymer physics class. And so I'm sort of learning uh, in the field. And in the end, if I have to say that after 10 years of doing research and transport in polymers, in the end, I learned what uh, I could have learned much uh, earlier if I had uh, read uh, Paul Flory's book which is essentially what, what this quote says that I like. It says essentially the properties of polymers come from the fact that polymers are 
very, very long molecules. And then you'll see that's really what governs charge transport in these materials. So we, I came to it from sort of more of a thinking of a, a inorganic material scientist. And then of course I had to learn that what's really special about polymers is that polymers are long chain molecules. So if you're a student and you space out at some point, just remember that this is really my conclusion uh, after uh, many years of research. So don't make the same mistake. If you work in polymers, take a polymer physics class. It will really pay off. Now, why are people interested in conjugated polymers? Well, you can use them for a number of applications. Um, some of them are conventional, what people call the big three are organic LEDs, organic transistors, and organic photovoltaics, because these are probably the lion's share of the market of what conjugated polymers would do. Um, organic LEDs actually are already in the market, not in the form of polymers, but small molecules. HTC was the very first um, cell phone company that um, commercialized um, a cell phone that had a, a organic molecule, uh, an OLED um, display. And uh, uh, Carl Leo in Germany showed that you can actually make uh, OLED white light, so the efficiencies are higher than 100 lumens per watt. And so this is another application space of organic LEDs. Uh, which is uh, white lighting. So replace uh, all your LEDs, but now you can make them over large areas. Um, I guess as an aside, why, why would you replace conventional materials with polymers? The general idea is that you can dissolve them in a solvent. And so you can print them like you print newspaper or like you stencil print um, t-shirts. So you can make electronics over large areas at very, very low cost. Um, in terms of transistors, uh, you like to have very large arrays of uh, transistors because that's what drives a display. So you could have a display that's made of organic LEDs and driven by organic transistors. And uh, in transistors, carrier mobility really is what matters. And now we have polymers that have mobilities in the order of 10 centimeters square per volt second. And, and to give you an idea, amorphous silicon has a mobility of one centimeter square per volt second. And pretty much all large area electronics uh, is driven by amorphous silicon transistors. So polymers do um, quite well uh, in terms of this metric of mobility. Of course, there's other metrics that are important, but if you don't have mobility, you shouldn't even bother. Right? That's kind of a necessary condition. And in terms of photovoltaics, we all know that there is a big push to go towards uh, renewable energy sources. Organic photovoltaics can be printed over large areas very cheaply. And so that makes also the cost of installation lower because you can print them on foil, uh, which is much easier to install than the big glass panels that uh, uh, the big panels that currently um, silicon um, solar cells come into. Uh, also organics have colors. So you can imagine having a window in a building that has color and is also a solar cell. Um, and, and, and the company that's really uh, pushing the commercialization of organic photovoltaics is Heliatech in Germany, started also by uh, Carl Leo's group. Um, and they've shown quite nice demonstrators out in the field. In terms of research, now people have shown cells that have power conversion efficiencies higher than 18%. So they're small cells, but they're nice demonstrators um, how high you can go in power conversion efficiency. Um, to give you an idea of where we can go with uh, organic transistors and organic LEDs, I like this demonstration. Sony's latest flexible display prototype is thin the, uh, and sound. sturdy enough to be wrapped up um, while still showing video images. The 4.1 inch screen has a resolution of 432 by 240 pixels. So you can see the screen that uh, gets uh, unfurled, rolled on and off uh, while it shows video rate images. And this It looks like I dropped off. I'm sorry. Yeah, Alberto, I think let me. At what point did I drop off? Yeah, I think we are back. Okay. At, at what point did I drop off when I was showing this video? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it, this is just to show that um, you can, using organic uh, uh, LEDs, you can make a display that can un be furled and unfurled while showing video rate images, which is impossible to do with any other technology. And you've probably already seen uh, in the news that uh, foldable cell phones are coming to the market. There's been sort of already a, an attempt by Samsung that didn't go so well 
but this is something that's happening for sure. And uh, these are enabled by organic LEDs. You can't do that with other uh, LCD technologies. We also like uh, organic materials as semiconductors uh, because uh, you can use them for an educational purpose. I uh, teach a lab class where students actually make uh, transistors, source cells and LEDs. In one class they make it and in the following lab they characterize it and that would be impossible with any other technology. So these are, this is some of a broader motivation as to why we like um, organic materials for electronics. Um, scientifically, uh, there's advantages and disadvantages. So this is a, a, a review paper by Antonio Facchetti at Northwestern University in Poliera showing in 2007 uh, the number of materials that existed. And now, of course, there's many, many more. And this is a little bit daunting because you see there's a lot of materials out there. And, and if I have to think a little bit more broadly, if I think of the world of um, inorganic semiconductors, there's quite a few elements that are involved. There's silicon, germanium, gallium, nitrogen, indium, aluminum, phosphorus, boron, and so on. But in the end, not so many crystal structures, right? There's a few crystal structures that these atoms are arranged in. In organics is almost the opposite. You have sort of few atoms, mostly carbon and hydrogen. Some semiconductors are only carbon and hydrogen like pentacene. Once in a while you have um, sulfur, uh, once in a while you have nitrogen or uh, uh, what is it, um, uh, fluorine, but not so many elements, but you have almost uh, an infinite amount of molecules that you can make and they will all crystallize with different crystalline structures. And as I'll show you, this really affects how they behave um, electronically. Um, so because um, function follows form, every crystalline structure will give you different functionality. It's great because it says that you can really tune the material to do what you want it to do. But at the same time, uh, every material will behave a little bit differently. And it's really daunting as a material scientist to see this variety of materials. But all these materials have commonalities and this is sort of what I wanna to try to get at uh, today. And the first commonality, you see it right away if you sort of squint, you'll see that all these materials have in common this alternation of double and single bonds, right? This is uh, what they all have. And that alternation is called conjugation. And I'll show you in a second that that's what makes these materials semiconductors because that's a little um, counterintuitive. You're used to thinking of polymers as plastics and plastics are great insulators. Uh, but um, in the um, 80s, uh, a combination of Alan Heger, uh, Alan McDermott and Shirakawa, uh, found that conjugated polymers can actually conduct electricity and uh, the property that allows them to conduct electricity is this alternation of single and double bonds. And there's several ways of understanding this either as a chemist or as a physicist. And I like sort of to the idea of uh, building the conjugated molecule, in this case, this would be polyacetylene uh, bond by bond. So if you start with a single carbon double bond, um, the way it works is that you have the p orbital of carbon um, that will form the bond. Um, and so they will um, hybridize and form a molecular bond. And this gives, um, so they give a, a bonding orbital and anti-bonding orbital. And this is a gain of energy of uh, twice this parameter beta, which is an integral that you can calculate quantum mechanically. Now, if I put a double bond, a single bond and a double bond, what I'm doing is I'm putting in a row four of these two p orbitals and I can calculate the molecular orbital of, in this case, this is butadiene. And this is what it looks like. I have two bonding orbitals, two anti-bonding orbitals. And I, when I populate the orbitals with electrons, I get a gain of 4.48 beta. And the reason why that's important is that you see that having actually this hybridized orbital that involves all four 2p orbitals of carbon is better than having just two separate two separate double bonds would give me a gain of four beta, but this hybridized orbital gives me a gain of 4.48 beta. So sort of delocalize the electrons more and more always gives you a gain. And so you can uh, sort of build up this infinite chain of polyacetylene this way. And eventually you can show that asymptotically you end up with uh, a band structure that looks like that of a semiconductor with a valence band that's full. You can kind of see it here. This would be a valence band and you see that it's full. A conduction band that's empty. You can see this would be these orbitals. Then you actually have a band gap that asymptotically is about 1.5 EV for polyacetylene. And this would be the sort of the band gap of butadiene. 
So if you have to look at trends, uh, you see that increasing the conjugation length, so this is a conjugation length of two bonds, this is a conjugation length of four, and this is infinity, uh, gives you a few trends. So you can see that the energy of the electrons on average goes down, so it's always advantageous to increase the conjugation length if possible. You can see that you're narrowing the band gap. You go from a broader band gap to a narrower band gap. And also you see that the valence band edge goes up and the conduction band edge goes down. Um, so these are general trends when you increase conjugation, um, this is true. And uh, chemists like to call the valence band edge homo, the conduction band edge lumo. Uh, physicists like to call these valence band and conduction band edges. Now, um, if you go back here, uh, you have uh, the bandwidth of the semiconductor. Um, and of course, this is given, you can just use band theory, and, and this is given by the orbital overlap. So if you take the, the S orbitals, they can also form a band, but of course, it is completely populated, so it's not going to have any charge transport. And it has a very large bandwidth. The bandwidth is the difference between the energy here at the central uh, center of the Brillouin zone and here at the edge. And this has a big bandwidth um, because there is a lot of or, uh, orbital overlap. And uh, if you haven't taken solid state physics yet, having a big bandwidth means that charges move fast. Just think of it like uh, uh, if this was an inverted uh, slope, so it was upside down, a charge would really slide very quickly here. So the curvature gives you how fast the charges move. Now I've shown you that conjugation is given by the p orbitals, so they look like this. And they don't overlap a whole lot. They only overlap here at the edges. And so the bandwidth is lower. So another sort of back of the envelope thought here is that if, if you want to have a big bandwidth, you need to have big orbital overlap. And big bandwidth is good for transport because the charges can move very fast in a band that has a big bandwidth. Now, these are, things are not as simple in conjugated polymers. Um, because uh, the conjugation length can change. And I showed you that uh, the, the, band, um, the, the band gap depends on conjugation length. That's a little bit different from conventional semiconductors. In conventional semiconductors, the band gap is given to you by nature. Silicon has a band gap of 1.12 electron volts and there's nothing else you can do. In polymers like polyacetylene, it turns out the band gap depends on conjugation, like I show you. So the same polymer can have different band gaps depending on the effective conjugation or how many of those orbitals are lined up. So how do you change a number of orbitals? Well, you can change the length of the polymer, right? You have monomers and you stitch them together. And as you stitch them together, the band gap is decreasing. And this can be shown very nicely, just actually by optical absorption. You can see the absorption of the band gap. And this is an old paper that shows it. And you can see that the band gap goes from high to low as you add repeat units. But there is another way to change a band gap and that's due to disorder and defects. Um, if the orbitals are all lined up like this, they're all conjugated. But if you put a twist, this breaks the conjugation. So here you go from three, uh, six, 10 uh, orbitals, a conjugation of 10 orbitals that will have a low band gap to a conjugation of twice four orbitals that has a lower band gap. So even along the chain, you can think that the band gap is changing. And this has nothing to do with how many monomers you have, but it has to do with a disorder and the twists and turns along the chain. So the shorter the conjugation length, the wider the band gap. And this will be a general principle that you'll have to keep in mind. Now, how does that happen? Well, you know, I'm Italian, so I like pasta. And a polymer film really is like a plate of spaghetti where you have some regions that are straight and in a region that is straight, all the orbitals are li uh, nicely lined up. So this would be a region that has uh, a high bandwidth. But once in a while you have a kink and this breaks the conjugation here because now if there's a kink along here, this orbital cannot overlap with this orbital. So now this ring is its own conjugation. This ring is its own conjugation. And so I'll have something that has a shorter bandwidth or a wider band gap. So in a polymer film, you really have a distribution people often think of as a Gaussian distribution in a density of states of band gaps. While in a crystalline material, you have a very well-defined band gap. And so again, defects really have a big effect on the electronic structure of the polymer. Now we talked about how things happen along the chain, uh, but of course, um, 
you assemble the chains in a film, but it's the same principle. If I have one chain that has a certain molecular orbital that's populated, another chain that has a, another molecular orbital, and there is a certain distance, these two will hybridize and form um, a bonding orbital. And if I put them closer, this is called a pi stacking distance, the bandwidth goes up because now there's more overlap. And remember, bigger overlap means bigger bandwidth, so a broader band and a narrower band gap. So far away, wide band gap, close together, narrower band gap. So this now explains how you can sort of at a very basic level understand the electronic structure of these polymers. Um, you have, these are 2D conductors because you have overlap along the chain and you have overlap chain to chain. This is called the pi stacking direction. And so you can build a band diagram of these polymers. So along the chain is this direction in the brillouin zone. And because the atoms are close, there's a lot of overlap, which means that you have a big bandwidth. The bandwidth is a distance from here to here, which means charges move fast along the chain. And when you go chain to chain, you have less overlap because these are about four angstroms away while atoms are about one and a half angstrom away. So less overlap, which means not as big of a bandwidth, but still you have some bandwidth, which means some transport going from chain to chain. And that's how you get the 2D band structure of these conjugated polymers. So they really are like semiconductors, but remember the conjugation uh, changes with defects. And also you can imagine because there is no covalent bond between this chain and this chain as a weak Van der Waals bond, there can be a lot of variation in this distance. And when you vary this distance, you're again changing the band gap and that's an electronic defect. On top of that, polymers are very strongly an isotropic. Silicon is isotropic. Some of the inorganic semiconductors are an isotropic to some extent, but polymers are very strongly an isotropic. They're essentially like a mini coax cable. So they have a semiconductor core, but then in order to dissolve the polymer, you need to use these alkyl chains and these are insulating. So if when I assemble all these little semiconductor cores in a film, they face each other like this. So I have good transport in this direction. I have pretty good transport in this direction, but then I have terrible transport in this third direction because this is essentially um, uh, polyethylene, which is a very good insulator. So charges will have pretty much no mobility to go from here to here, good mobility to go from here to here, okay mobility to go from here to here. And then you wonder how are they gonna go from here to there? And this is actually going to be a, a big part of the topic of today's talk which means that depending on how these polymer chains are oriented in space, they will have their direction of transport oriented differently. So for example, if the molecules are sitting like this, which we call face on, they have poor in-plane transport because in this direction, transport will be good, but from here to here, it's like going from here to there, transport will be terrible. So this type of crystalline texture is good to extract charges up and down. For example, an LED, you inject charges like a sandwich, so you want molecules to sit like this or in a solar cell. In a transistor, you want charges to circulate in this plane, so you actually want molecules to sit like a deck of card on its edge so that you have good transport here and good transport there, so the two good transport directions are in the plane. So this anisotropy plays a big role into how crystalline texture couples into electronic performance and then uh, into the particular device that you're interested in. And it turns out that uh, these materials have a wide range of microstructures. So if you take polythiophenes, uh, polythiophene, thiophene means it's a five-membered ring with a sulfur atom and it's conjugated. We can see double, single, double. We can play a lot of games with the structure of the polymer. So poly 3 hexothiophene is probably the most common um, conjugated polymer semiconductor. And if I change the molecular weight, you get by AFM very different microstructures and you see the mobility changes by four orders of magnitude. If you think in a world of silicon, you play a lot of games to change the mobility by 10% by using germanium to strain it or something like that. Here, by just changing the length of this chain because it changes the microstructure, you get a change in mobility of four orders of magnitude factor 10,000. If you just take these chains away, remember I told you these are to dissolve the polymer in a solvent, they don't have any electronic functionality directly, I'll show you that indirectly they play a big role, they don't have any electronic functionality directly, um, 
you actually turn the material into uh, something that when you thermally anneal it, its mobility increases by a factor of 25, which is again, a huge change because this material actually is liquid crystalline. This one does not have a revealed liquid crystalline phase. This one does. So you change the thermal properties of the polymer and you're able to increase the mobility from 0.01 to 0.1. If you fuse these two rings, again, for a physicist, this sounds like a pretty small change. The molecule looks pretty similar, just these two rings are fused. You actually are able to generate these microstructures with large terraces. And now you have mobilities all the way actually up to one, which is the mobility of amorphous silicon. So you see within a pretty restricted materials family, we really haven't done a whole lot with a conjugated part of the molecule. You get a wide range of microstructures and you know, material scientists love to say that microstructure controls properties and you can really see it here quite vividly. So the work in my group that we've been doing for now years is really understanding how the microstructure controls mobility. And with the idea that if you understand that well, you can start designing the most advantageous microstructure for charge transport. So if we think of the microstructure of a conjugated polymer, because they're pretty rigid, they like to crystallize. You can see these crystals here, but because it's a polymer, you never form a microstructure that's completely crystalline. So you have what is called a semi-crystalline microstructure with ordered regions and disordered regions. And this makes understanding transport extremely complex because we have models for transport for things that are ordered, crystals. We have models for transport for things that are disordered, uh, like amorphous silicon, but things that are mixed are really difficult to treat um, theoretically. But it turns out with a very simple principle that I showed you, you can simplify this problem quite a lot. Remember I told you that the band gap depends on twists and turns. And if you have a twist, it makes a region with a broader band gap. While if you have a straight region, uh, you have a region with a narrower band gap. So let's apply this principle to this microstructure. This disordered region that has a lot of twists and turns must have a broader band gap. This ordered region, which is straighter, must have a narrower band gap. So every time you have an interface between a disordered region and an ordered region, you actually have what is called a type one heterojunction between a wide band gap semiconductor and a narrow band gap semiconductor, which means that if I am a hole, a carrier, uh, a charge carrier that's a positive charge carrier, I will want to go from the disordered region into the ordered region. And if I'm an electron, I will want to go from the disordered region into the ordered region as well. So the conclusion is that in this type of microstructure, the charge carriers really like to stay in the ordered region. So it's actually a lot simpler than we thought. We can sort of ignore the disordered regions as long as all these ordered regions are connected in a per percolative fashion. So you can see right away, you start getting some different ideas of charge transport that have to do with percolation. These have to do all, be all connected so that charges can go from point A to point B exclusively in the ordered regions. Because if they have to go from here to there, you'll have to inject them into a disordered region that has a bigger band gap and there's an injection barrier. So our goal now is to really understand transport in the ordered regions, because that's sort of the elemental part of transport and then how those disordered regions are connected. So if I break down my microstructure to transport problem, the length scales that I'm interested in is what happens in the disordered regions, sorry, in the ordered regions, and then how are the ordered regions connected between them? So let's start what happened in the ordered regions really at the uh, molecular level. Well, if you take two molecules and uh, you look at the frontier orbital, so the homos, they will have um, sign inversions, they will have nodes because they're not the lowest possible um, energy level. Remember that you populate all the way up to the edge. Um, and so this means that these will have nodes. So imagine I have one molecule and here's another molecule. And I'm wondering how am I, how is my charge going from one molecule to the next molecule? Because I showed you polymers, charges can go along the chain, but at some point they have to hop onto another chain because they can go very long distances on a single chain. Well, if the molecules are arranged in space like this, there is a big orbital between this molecule and that orbit and that molecule. And so they'll be able to go. See the orbitals overlap and they have the right sign. And so there is bandwidth to go from here to there. But now imagine that I slide this molecule just by two atomic units. Now all of a sudden, the signs are inverted. And so essentially the integral, the overlap integral to go from here to there goes to zero. So now transport actually is completely suppressed from here to there. 
This has been shown very nicely theoretically in this paper by Jean-Luc Bredas, this is a PNAS paper that I uh, recommend reading, where they track this energy here, which is the equivalent of the bandwidth, so how well charges can go from this molecule to that molecule, as a function of sliding of these molecules with respect to each other. And you can see there are these wild oscillations with even sliding in the order of an angstrom. So very small perturbation on the sliding can actually change a lot how easily electrons can go from one molecule to the next. Which means that if I wanna know how well they go, I need to know the crystalline structure very accurately. I really need to know how these molecules pack at the molecular level, almost at the atomic level actually. For us in polymers, that's a problem because the way you do that is by X-ray diffraction. And you can think of this like a system of equations and variables. If I wanna know where the positions of all these atoms are, I need to have enough equations to be able to pinpoint all the coordinates. And these equations are actually given to me by the diffraction peaks. And I have to know them very accurately. And you can see the diffraction peaks here are quite broad and there's not that many of them. You see there's not as many diffraction peaks as atoms in this molecule, which is what I need to do to be able to solve for the unit cell. So that's a fundamental problem. And when we thought about this for a while, and what we concluded is that what we needed to do is we need to make polymers that were shorter and shorter until we found the shortest polymer that would give me the same diffraction pattern as the polymer. And a short polymer is called an oligomer. And we actually found that the 13 mer, so if I take 13 of these thiophene units, I get the same diffraction pattern as the long polymer. But because it's a short molecule, it crystallizes much better. And so I get a much better idea of where the diffraction peaks are and how intense they are. So with this 13 mer, we were actually able to resolve the unit cell of the polymer, which then tells us how are these orbital overlaps um, arranged in space, which allows us to figure out the bandwidth for uh, electrons to go from one molecule to the next. So this is the diffraction pattern of the 13 mer, and we really wanted to compare it to something else. We wanted to know how, how much does it matter? And we got this molecule from Rachel Siegelman, and you see it's pretty much the same molecule. The conjugated core is the same, but the side chain is different. Rather than being a straight side chain, it has this little kick here. So this is called P3-ethylhexothiophene. And the diffraction pattern, this one crystallizes very nicely to the diffraction pattern, is pretty similar. You can see there is a line of peaks here, there's a line of peaks here, there's another line of peaks here, there's another line of peaks here. But if you look at the numbers here at where this diffraction occurs, it's different. So you already know there is some difference between them. And so we're trying to resolve also the unit cell of this molecule, and this is where uh, work with uh, Gregorio and Eduardo was really uh, was really great. They really put a lot of effort into this by a combination of NMR and X-ray diffraction and so on. And the unit cell of P3HT looks like this. So the molecules are nicely stacked like a deck of cards. And so you can imagine there's a good overlap going from here to here. But P3EHT actually, this little change is enough to change the structure of the unit cell. And what uh, Gregorio and Eduardo found is that now one molecule and the other one, they're not looking at each other like this, but there is a slight slant. And you can see, you can imagine, and also there is a shift. And uh, so having the slant and the shift, you can already imagine, makes the orbital overlap from this to this actually quite difficult. Uh, we worked with uh, John Northrup at the time at Park to calculate uh, the band structure of these two crystalline uh, uh, unit cells. So this is the bandwidth along the chain and it's high as you can imagine. And this here is the bandwidth from chain to chain. And you can see there is some bandwidth in P3HT, but in P3EHT, it's actually completely flat or it's what a flat band means there is no bandwidth, which means remember bandwidth means overlap. If there is no bandwidth, it means no overlap. And in fact, the mobility of P3HT is quite high all the way up to 0.1. The mobility of P3EHT is terrible, 10 to the minus five. So you see when I said the side chains don't have any effect electronically, I lied. They don't have any effect electronically directly because they don't transport charge, but they can change the shape of the unit cell. And by changing the shape of the unit cell, they can completely suppress transport. So first lesson, uh, again, this has to do with polymers and how they assemble, uh, going back to um, Paul Flory um, and, and the fact that even at the 
uh, molecular level, you really need to know how these molecules kind of look at each other to figure out the overlaps, because if you don't have a good overlap, you don't get good transport. Small changes in side chains can have large effect on overlap integrals. And why is that related to flory? Well, I have the side chains because a polymer is a long molecule. And if I want to dissolve a long molecule, I need to put something on the side so that the solvent can grab it. So the side chains are a necessity of making the polymer soluble and they actually have quite a big effect on transport, but it's an indirect effect on the structure. So it's a microstructural effect. Okay, so this is uh, sort of at the molecular scale. Now, what about connecting one crystal to the next? How should we think about that? Well, uh, these chains, because they're semi-flexible polymers, um, rather than the freely jointed model of a polymer where you have some something very rigid and then a joint where you can articulate, you should think of it like a worm-like chain, which means that it's, it's a semi-flexible polymer that's kind of continuously changing its conformation. So one way to think about it is that if I have a straight segment, for example, in a crystal, there is statistically a certain chance that the molecule will go straight for a while and then it will slowly twist and turn. So you can see here, this chain will straighten the crystal here, and then it goes kind of straight for a while and eventually it takes a kink. This one actually goes straight for a while longer, and this one goes straight less. So you see it's a statistical distribution. And because it's statistics, I can sort of put a red um, outline here that says on average, this is how far the chain will go being straight until it will eventually have turned. But again, this is statistics. So this is how you should think about it. Every time you see a straight segment, it can go straight for a while and then it kind of gently curves. Sometimes it will curve less gently because there's a distribution of distances you can go straight before you hit a curve. And so we use this model uh, to uh, figure out how transport occurs along a single chain. To go back to our microstructure, what we thought is that, well, this region is disordered, so we'll think of it very simple-mindedly as amorphous polymers. And so let's build a model of worm-like chain, uh, of transport along worm-like chain uh, uh, polymers in an amorphous microstructure. So you can take a brute force approach where you have a molecular dynamic simulation of these chains, you melt it, you quench it, and then you put a charge and you move it. Uh, that's computationally extremely expensive and uh, that limits your simulation box, which means that you can only model transport along short distances. Um, to solve this problem, actually, uh, Andy Spakowitz and Camille really came up in, in chemical engineering at Stanford, came up with a brilliant idea, which is essentially saying, well, the charge really sits on a single chain. We don't, we don't have to simulate the whole microstructure. Let's just say that the chain has a certain conformation due to the chain statistics. Um, Andy is a statistical physicist. So this idea that these twists and turns have a statistical distribution. So I'll extract the statistics uh, the, the confirmation from the well-known statistics of polymer confirmation. So I have a single chain, I put a charge on the chain, I use a field to move it, and so the charge moves along the field, the field pushes it up. Eventually, the charge hits a kink where the field wants to push it one way, but the chain is in another direction. So now the charge has two options, either uh, energetically unfavorable, but there's always a chance that that happened according to the Boltzmann factor, that it goes against the field, but along the chain or it sits here long enough that it eventually hops to a neighboring chain. Once I decide statistically that it's hopped to a neighboring chain, I now simulate the conformation of the neighboring chain and I run the same uh, transport uh, simulation again. And so I go on and on. I average over multiple uh, conformations and this allows me to essentially simulate transport over very long times. And what you see is that at short times, this is a log-log plot of distances versus time, so it's a little misleading. But at, so being to the left of this plot means going fast, being to the right means going slowly. So I see that at short times, the charge goes fast, and, and that's intuitively obvious. The charge goes along the chain. And remember, along the chain, you have a big bandwidth because you have a lot of overlap, and so the mobility is high. Charge goes fast along the chain. But then if I wait long enough, I will need these chain to chain hops for charges to move further and those will be limiting for speed. And so at long distances, the charge goes slowly because it's limited by these chain to chain hops. So I have two transport regimes, fast at short times and slow at long times. So how does that relate to 
how it transferred from crystal to crystal. And what relates to it very intuitively. Um, well, first of all, actually, uh, this is, like I said, it's, it's fairly obvious this would happen, but the part that's a little bit less obvious is uh, what is the distance where this change from fast to slow occurs? And it turns out that Andy showed theoretically and then demonstrated numerically that that distance is about the persistence length, which is the length that the chain stays just about straight. So again, if you think about it, it's fairly intuitive, but it was nice to see it fall out from the theory. And, and this is how it connects to our problem of connecting crystals. If the crystals are close enough that the distance is about a persistence length, then the charge can go from one crystal to the other without encountering a kink. And so it can take advantage of the fast mobility. So if the distance is short, essentially these two crystals are electrically shorted because the fast mobility connects them. But if this distance is long, like you see here, then there is enough kinks that the charge will have to hop from chain to chain and uh, transport will not be effective. So I have this, this one crystal, I wanna go from this crystal to this crystal. I have a fast path here, but I can also have a slow path here. And so what we concluded is that in the microstructure of the semi-crystal and polymer, charge transfer will occur quickly when the crystals are connected by chains and the connection is just about a persistence length or uh, shorter. And again, going back to Flory, this is uh, a very fundamental uh, concept of having our material being made of long molecules. In inorganic semiconductors, you cannot bridge one grain to the other with a chain. There are no chains in inorganic semiconductors. This is really a fundamental properties of using polymers as uh, semiconductors. So this is a nice theory, but it turns out we had data that showed it experimentally already. We just had to analyze it the proper way. And we go, went back to this P3EHT polymer that actually Rachel Siegelman made because she liked it liquid, its liquid crystalline properties. And in particular that you could put it in a liquid crystalline phase and you could actually melt it at about 80 degrees. And if you quenched it back uh, to room temperature where it's supposed to be liquid crystal and you can see it by rubbing, for example, it will slowly crystallize back. Um, so you can do sort of old school heat and beat metallurgy where you quench something in a melt, then you crystallize it at a lower temperature and you can watch it crystallize. It takes you know, hours if, you're, um, if you quench it deep enough. And uh, we had time at the synchrotron and you could really follow the degree of crystallinity uh, as a function of time. So we, what we could do is essentially look at how this material crystallizes in real time and we can measure transport in real time and try to relate the two. Now there's different ways to measure the crystallinity and, and there's a lot of details there. One is X-ray diffraction, as I showed you, but um, you, sometimes you have aggregates that are too small to diffract, but you can actually, by optical spectroscopy, you can calculate how many of these aggregates are. And this is again, work with uh, Gregorio and Eduardo. Uh, so if you do optical absorption, you can deconvolute the optical absorption spectrum in an aggregate fraction, an amorphous fraction. And now you can plot because you can measure the optical absorption as a function of time. You can plot the fraction of aggregates as a function of time, and you can do it for films of different thicknesses. And you can do it also by NMR, by looking at these peaks. These peaks are um, related to the rigid fraction of the polymer. So these are all sort of things that are related, but not quite the same. Crystals, aggregates, rigid fraction. But what uh, Gregorio and Eduardo showed very nicely in this paper that is that they all track. So they're kind of all similar uh, parts of the film. So in this case, by NMR, this is not a thin film, uh, you can track uh, the rigid fraction. And if you can track this as a function of time, you can do kinetics. Um, so what we found is the polymer really grows, the polymer crystal grows by elongating the chain, by straightening out the chain. And you can use a modified Avrami equation to figure out the kinetics. And the interesting aspect there is as a function of film thickness, for example, this parameter L, which is the rate at which the chain elongates, that parameter L uh, depends very strongly on film thickness. So it becomes faster and faster the thinner the film, which has to do with conformation, right? It's easier for the polymer chain to grow if the film is thinner because all the chains will already be in the right conformation so they can grow faster. And so the nucleation rate depends strongly on um, the, the film thickness for a similar region, a reason. That there is a higher chance of forming a nucleus where the chains are already in the right conformation. The polymer is thinner because the confinement limits the conformations of the polymer. So this is a really nice fundamental kinetic study. But the bottom line is that what I want to show you is that this allowed us 
to measure the degree of crystallinity of the film as a function of time and the size of the crystals as well, because we have the kinetics of how they grow. And so you can now measure the fractional aggregates You can as a function of time. You can measure mobility as a function of time, which means that you can measure mobility as a function of fractional aggregates. And when you plot one against the other, you get this sort of percolation type behavior. All of a sudden, when the fraction of aggregates is higher than a certain fraction, boom, mobility picks up. Remember, mobility is still pretty bad because this is P3 EHT. So in the crystals, there is no overlap. But it does go up when the polymer crystallizes because the chains are straighter and the charges can move fast on a, on a straight chain. So the idea that we had is that when this mobility onset occurs, the charges are percolating in this path of crystals. And because we could measure the fraction of aggregates, the size of the aggregates, we could actually calculate distance between crystals, the average distance between crystals as a function of time. So we can see what's the average distance between crystals when mobility starts picking up. And it turns out for these two very different molecular weight polymers, where you can see the mobility picks up at different fraction of aggregates, actually the distance between the edges of the crystals is about, you know, it's pretty similar in the order between two and three nanometers. And it turns out the persistence length is exactly in that range. So the theory that the crystals need to be within one persistence length for transport to occur effectively is borne out by experimental data. Uh, this is of course only one case, but it's sort of the only case where you can do this measurement accurately enough. So I'm not gonna say it has to be exactly the persistence length, but it has to be on the order of a persistence length. So now if you're a polymer physicist, this is interesting because a persistence length has to do with the flexibility of the polymer. And so, you know, what does this distance between crystal have to be? Well, if you have a rigid polymer, it can be larger. If you have a flexible polymer, it has to be shorter because the persistence length is shorter. And so the bottom line is that when the distance between aggregates is reduced to the persistence length of the polymer, the charges percolate and transport can occur. So this was sort of a really nice way of putting everything together. Um, and understanding how charge transport occur in this type of microstructure. But if you take a step back, and I have to accelerate a little bit here, I'm sorry, I see I'm, I'm about to run out of time. You wonder why do we have to go through all these complicated X-ray diffraction and NMR and so on? Why can't we just look at the microstructure and look at the distance between crystals and how they're connected? What tool would we use as a classical material scientist to do that? And the tool that we will use is transmission electron microscopy, which is really the tool that turned material science from kind of more of an art into a science because we could really see the microstructures. But we can't really use electron microscopy on these polymers because they are uh, very delicate and they fry in the electron beam. But it turns out in the last 10 years, um, there's been incredible advances in electron microscopy technology driven by structural biologists who want to know the structure of proteins. So there is now very sensitive detectors and very advanced numerical techniques to analyze um, signal when there's a lot of noise. So we thought of taking advantage of that for our polymers and the one technique that we use, we use two techniques. One of them is called 4D stem, where you essentially focus the beam down to about a square nanometer and collect the diffraction pattern downstream. So what you do is you raster the beam and collect all these diffraction patterns. So it's scanning nano diffraction. And in this case, it's counterintuitive because you're focusing the beam down, but you don't care because even if film gets damaged, you've collected the diffraction pattern and that has all the information you need. So if you collect the diffraction pattern like this uh, and you raster it, for example, if I take these two diffraction peaks, these correspond to the pi stacking, which means that I can tell that there's molecules oriented edge on like this. And I will represent these. So this tells me that the chain where I took this diffraction pattern, the chain has to have this orientation. So I'll represent it like this. And then I scan my beam and I build up a representation of how the chains must be oriented. So this line is not a single chain because it presents a crystal but it represents the orientation of the chain in these regions. And with this, I can literally then build up the microstructure. So I took PB triple T, which is this polymer that has a high mobility. This is the AFM scan, it has these terraces, but now we can actually look at what's inside those terraces. And this is the orientation of the chains in all these terraces. So you can see how they're oriented in space and uh, how this relates to these terraces. So you see the sizes are about the same. So these terraces are these regions of single orientation, but now I know how they're oriented. And that's important because I need to know how the charge is gonna go from one crystallite 
to the other, and that depends on how they're oriented with respect to each other, because you can have a high angle grain boundary or a low angle grain boundary. I will actually, since I'm running out of time, I will uh, skip through this part where we show the correlations between the chains. Then we work again with Andy Spakowitz. Remember that these are not single chains, they're sort of representation of general chain orientation. But because he's a theorist, once he has that, he can actually figure out how the single chains are oriented within these crystals. And these are the single chains here, 1% of them. See, they're much shorter than these regions of order. And once you have the single chains, you can simulate transport. And these are transport simulations that we're running that really show, so black to red is time. So I put charges here and I see where they go in the film as a function of time. And it really shows that sometimes charges can get stuck in some regions of the film and sometimes they can travel fast. So you can really build this understanding of how charges move through this really disordered film and how defects, and these are mesoscale defects, can affect transport. Now, the very last bit that I want to show you in just a couple of minutes um, has to do with something even more challenging. So it's great. We have this non diffraction uh, technique. It sounds like we've solved the problem of the microstructure of, or figure out the microstructure of conjugated polymers. Because if you look over history, mobility has been going up as people have been making more and more crystalline polymers. So it's great. Crystalline polymers diffract. We have a technique that measures diffraction. We have everything lined up to figure out how this works. But just in the last 10 years, actually, there's sort of a new generation of polymers that don't diffract a whole lot, but have higher mobility. This IDTBT polymer that I'll show you in a minute is sort of the archetypal of that. So this is extremely challenging for us because if things don't diffract, they become very difficult to characterize. And for the stem, the micro diffraction technique that I showed you is really good at characterizing uh, things that diffract. So for this IDTBT polymer, we actually use more conventional high resolution TM, but done at very, very low dose. We're going with six electrons per square angstrom per second, which is what people use in structural biology. And I don't really have time to go into the details, but essentially this is phase contrast. So the polymer just deviates the electron beam just a tiny little bit. And so this puts a little, um, uh, modulation in the phase of the beam. And in order to see that, you actually have to defocus the image. So there's a lot of technical aspects on how you do that, but it's in the end fairly conventional for TM where, when you don't have, um, when you don't have uh, intensity contrast, but you have phase contrast, which is what happens in soft matter. You have to remember in TM, you're looking at a projection. Um, so you don't really know what the structure is through the film. You're just looking at what's coming, the 2D projection of the film. Um, and um, the way we do it is uh, we take the high resolution TM and then we take a Fourier transform at different spatial frequencies. Uh, let me explain this to you. Um, so this is IDTBT, this is a polymer. And when you do the diffraction, like I showed you, you don't see a whole lot, but there is this one peak here that you see, which actually corresponds to the peak along the polymer backbone. So the polymer backbone is rigid enough that it diffracts along the backbone. And this is a diffraction peak. So what you do is you have your TM image. And if I take a Fourier transform, you see this ring is actually the diffraction from the backbone peak. These other rings are uh, artifacts. So you have to uh, eliminate them. They really do to the imaging condition. So what you do is um, this is, so if you, if you take the Fourier transform, here's the backbone repeat diffraction. So what you do is you take your high resolution TM and you bandpass filter it at this, spatial frequency. So you put like a ring filter here. Um, this is not done physically, it's done numerically, so that you enhance the contrast from everything that diffracts at this angle. And, and you know that that's the backbone. And so all of a sudden, this is not again single backbones because you have to have a, a bunch of them to build up diffraction, but it gives you an idea of where the backbone is. And then you go in and each single little square there, you take the Fourier transform, and these diffraction peaks tell me in this little square, what is the direction of the backbone? And so all of a sudden that little square, I know where the backbone is. I step and repeat, and I can build up where the backbone is through the whole electron micrograph. And this looks like a mess, like it has no structure. But if I zoom in, actually, I see regions where the backbone is all oriented in the same direction. So that polymer that by X-ray diffraction looked amorphous, 
actually is nanocrystalline. You see it has regions of crystalline order. And in fact, if you do a little bit of numerical analysis, half of the area of the film, see 50% or more, is given by domain sizes that are 20 nanometers or larger. So these are not that small domains, it's 20 nanometers. Right, so this gives me now an idea that the microstructure of this IDTBT is again nanocrystals that are connected. I'll skip through this because it takes a little bit too long to explain. So this polymer actually has short range order. So it's kind of a short range order version of this guy. This guy had like 100 nanometer domains. This guy has 20 nanometer domains. And if you wonder why didn't it diffract, you have to remember that to build up diffraction, you need a lot of these stacks, right? So if I take, for example, these, uh, if I take a material and I stack it and I say, I can stack it in, let's say two, um, 50 stack aggregates or a lot of five stack aggregates. Oops. Oh, I'm sorry that uh, graph here disappeared. You wouldn't say that this material is more disordered than this one, but this, the red one would give you diffraction like on the right and the black one will give you diffraction like on the left. So this reminds you that when you look at X-ray diffraction and you say something that diffracts is more ordered, sort of order is in the eye of the beholder, right? I wouldn't say that this is more disordered than this. In fact, for transport, the red is much better than the black because here I have a nice percolation path while here, unless the charge gets to the very end and is able to hop, a charge will get stuck on this molecule, on that molecule. So this is a reminder uh, that X-ray diffraction doesn't tell the whole story. So in conclusion, the characterization of conjugated polymers to understand charge transport requires multimodal and multi-scale methods. X-ray diffraction and theoretical modeling provides information on the effect of crystallinity and crystal size on transport. But now we're uh, very excited about TM. We think it's very promising because we've developed these techniques. This has been two years in the, in the making. We have now low damage techniques. We can actually look at large areas. If I go back uh, to some of my micrographs, uh, these are you know about one by one micron and uh, the one that I showed earlier is even larger than that, if I remember correctly. Uh, this, this, is, this is maybe one and a half by one and a half microns. So we can look now at large areas that really makes us understand how these crystals are connected. Remember, you want to understand the charge transfer within the crystal, but also how they're connected. So you need to have that sort of square micron view of the microstructure to really figure out those connections. So large areas are accessible now to understand the mesoscopic structure. Uh, I didn't show it to you, but the TM is very data rich. So you can detect subtle effects by doing data analysis. Um, and then of course, theory is always important to understand how transport occurs in these complicated mesostructures. So with this, I'll thank you for your attention and uh, I'm happy to take any questions for as long as you like. Thanks everyone. Hi, Alberto. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, very nice talk. It's a, it's a lecture slash literature review. Very nice. And, and thank you a lot. Uh, are you listening to me well? Yeah, I can hear you yeah. perfectly. So uh, now a, a, a message to the audience. Um, the questions could be written, can, can be written on, on the Facebook, uh, sorry, on the YouTube chat. I'm going to tell them in Portuguese, ok, Alberto? Uh -huh. é, pessoal, as, as perguntas podem ser postadas ali no chat do YouTube, tá? Se você quiser fazer em português, eu traduzo pra, para o Saleu. Então, é, as perguntas podem ser postadas lá, tá joia? So, Alberto, uh, I have a few questions, but I'm going to let the audience speak first. Um, so, there is a question from my colleague, Eric Andrade. Uh, how does temperature affects mobility? So now the temperature. Yeah. So in um, um, in conjugated polymers, uh, mobility is thermally activated, and so um, unless uh, let me let me back up. So there is in, in organic semiconductors, if you form actually a perfect crystal, it behaves similarly to a conventional semiconductor. A transfer mode is, is slightly different, but it's similar enough. So in a perfect crystal. Uh, mobility actually increases when you decrease temperature. It's not T to the three halves, but similar enough. 
polymers are never that ordered. And so it turns out um, transport is thermally activated. You have to hop from one chain to the next. So in that case, you get the opposite effect. Mobility actually decreases when you decrease temperature, increases when you increase temperature, and it's thermally activated. So it's an Arrhenius law up to a certain temperature where the polymer melts. And at that point, anything can happen. Typically, it just jumps up, um, uh, sorry, jumps down to very low mobilities because uh, amorphous polymers have a lower mobility than crystalline polymers. Right. Um, Alberto, I'm, I'm curious about the resolution of this 4D steam. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, what is the size of the beam and, and, and how, right. you know, yeah, how low you can go in terms of, of resolution. Yeah, very good question. So first of all, it's called 4D. Uh, so it's, it's called STEM and STEM stands for scanning transmission electron microscopy, but it's not conventional STEM. This is a point of confusion. Uh, and it's called 4D because it's 2D in real space, right, because I'm scanning, and 2D in reciprocal space. So the resolution in reciprocal space, let's start with that, um, really depends on how well you can um, suppress the uh, center beam. So now we, are, we have access to, see here, you have this blooming. So we can't look at things that have low Q, which means big uh, repeat distances. Uh, and that's why, for example, you look at the pi stack, which is relatively high Q. Um, this is changing now because we have access to a new detector that has much bigger dynamic range. So we'll have access to low Q. Now, what's the resolution in real space, which is probably what you're more interested in? Well, it depends on how close you can put these beams um, next to each other, right? So how close can you put them next to each other depends on if your beam is focused and damages the film, how fast can you scan going from one point to the next before um, the beam uh, damages the film? So we've been able to go uh, with five nanometer steps. Uh, you can probably go uh, a little bit closer but you also have to think of what is the point of the measurement. And in this particular case, the point of the measurement is to raster a large area of the film so that uh, you can get a good view of the mesostructure of the film. Um, so we don't necessarily want to have these points very close together because we want to get this broader view. So I would say five nanometers is a good number to have in mind, but it's not uh, an absolute minimum. And in terms of focusing the beam down, we focus it down to a single digit square nanometer and, and it works okay, but then of course you have more damage. So you have to put all these things together to figure out what you're really interested in. So you kind of have a, there is no single answer to your question. You have a broad range of possible resolutions depending on what you're interested in. But 4D STEM is not good at uh, super high spatial resolution because you have to scan, but it's good at this broad range and it's good at collecting the fraction patterns, so figure out the crystalline structure locally. Right, and quickly, Alberto, how fast does the scan happen? Uh, I mean, I'm look, I'm just oh, asking uh, about because of the material degradation as well. And it's, yeah, so how how quick is the measurement? That's a good question. I think the scan itself is probably a half hour or so to get an image, something like that. It's, it's pretty fast and it's getting faster and faster. These cameras are, are absolutely amazing. What's been amazing there is the, the drive for the technology has been given by structural biologists because in the end, this is something that the biomed field is very interested in. And so biomed field invests a lot and that has driven an incredible development in camera technology and they're getting faster and faster. So I know in Berkeley now they have a faster camera that I think will allow to take an image in maybe 10 minutes or something like that. The, so the, the, the bottleneck is actually the data analysis. In terms of uh, materials damage, um, yeah, the, the faster you can go, the better it is. Um, I, I guess I, it also is, is very much materials dependent. Uh, I showed you PB triple T. It turns out that material is crystalline enough that so far we haven't really damaged it a whole lot. So we've been able to focus the beam down without a whole lot of damage. Um, so there, again, there is no single answer. It's very much experiment dependent. And, and that's why we learned is that to collect data, it takes quite a few attempts to get into the right um, regime. Thanks, Alberto. Um, a few compliments from the audience here. Uh, Vitor Canute 
says, thank you, Alberto, for the seminar. And William Kibela says, muito bom, which is very good in Portuguese. I loved thank the you. colloquium. So a, a few, few messages for, from you, uh, to you, Alberto. And another question here from Enrique Frulani. And uh, he asked uh, about an OACT condition. So now you have you know, mm -hmm. an elect electrolyte and an ion mm -hmm. uh, involved on all this mess, right? Mm -hmm. So he asked, when the ions enter the polymers, the polymer book, uh, they will certainly promote an increase in crystalline regime distances, correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. And the question is, are you guys studying this in interaction and, and how, you know, and now I'm, I'm gonna complement the question, can we somehow use this 4D stem? I, I think you have to do in high vacuum, but could you somehow use this to, to sort of probe the interaction mm -hmm. between now ions and polymers? Very, all very good questions. And um, so first uh, answer to the first question. Yeah, when the ions go in, they change the crystalline parameter. We've seen that by um, X-ray diffraction. And uh, we're writing up, uh, we, we, we wrote up a paper a while ago. There's a bunch of papers from David Ginger's group working at that, if anyone's interested. Um, and then we are writing up a couple of more papers. And what's interesting there is that the ions go in and then when you charge the OECT, they go in, when you discharge it, they go out. And then in some cases, the change in crystalline parameters is irreversible. In some changes, it's reversible. And, and it depends on what material you use, what ions you use, how many times you do it and so on. So there's a lot of interesting materials physics there. To answer your question about the 4D stem, when I started uh, convincing my students they needed to go into electron microscopy, that's what we had in mind. We were gonna look at microscopically, where do the ions go? How does this work? What does this polymer electrolyte interface look like? Um, and, and you can go with uh, increasing le levels of sophistication. So what we were gonna start with is you can um, charge up the polymer in, a, uh, in an electrochemical setup and then remove the electrolyte. And now your polymer is full of water and ions. And then what you do is you vitrify, and this is again, a technique that people in structural biology have developed because their proteins need to have their water around it or the structure collapse uh, collapses. But if you freeze the water, it forms ice crystals and that destroys the protein. But if you freeze it fast enough and there's now equipment that does it automatically, they're called vitribots, you vitrify the water, you essentially, the molecules stop moving in whatever conformation they are, you form vitreous water. Uh, and then you keep the sample at that low temperature, you can do cryo EM and preserve all the structures. So our plan was to start with that. So charge up the polymer, vitrify the water, put it in the TEM, and then look at what the structure is. And then to do that, we had to develop all this infrastructure. Um, and that took us a couple of years. And it turns out developing the infrastructure already gave us interesting enough results. But we're moving in that direction. It, it, it takes a while. It's our intention for sure, but it, these are difficult experiments. The next level of sophistication, so, so to go back actually to your question, Greg, um, yeah, the, the experiment is done in vacuum, but there's what are called cryo holders that have been developed again for structural biology that are insulated from the column. And so the beam goes through and you can have your sample that is uh, as water is vitrified um, in the TM column. The next level of sophistication is to actually do the experiment in situ. You have now people interested in batteries have developed holders that have electrodes, microfabricated electrodes in the TM. So you can make your film the TM, put your electrolyte, it all gets sealed. And then you can put biases and move ions in and out in the TM and look at what happens to the polymer. Um, again, that's uh, probably a whole PhD dissertation to make this work. Um, so we're hoping to get there. Um, I'm hoping if we don't do it, someone else does. But I think this is a very exciting uh, area of development. It is, and, and uh, we work with Andy Miner at the National Center for Electron Microscopy. We're not microscopists. I would say that if you're not a professional microscopist, you need a microscopist to work with. It is not something that you can learn and take on as a hobby. It's a full-time job to develop these techniques. And then there is a last aspect, which is the numerical analysis. This, uh, the, you get so much data. One of these sessions generates can generate hundreds of gigabytes of data that then a lot of it is in the uh, data processing. So we had to, I have two students that essentially are theorists. They do data processing. They've developed code that runs on GPUs uh, because you need that speed to be able to sift through this incredible amount of data. 
Yeah, all very interesting, uh, Alberto. Uh, I, I just got a message from uh, through WhatsApp. There is a friend, uh, Rafael. He cannot somehow connect to the YouTube chat, so he hooked up to to me via uh, WhatsApp, and he's asking. Uh, now back to the Petri EHT material uh, and X-ray experiments. He is asking why uh, there is a unidimensional growth of crystal uh, as opposed to the you know regular 3D isotropic growth of crystals. Yeah, that's a good question. I've been wondering about that too. Probably a polymer physicist would have a good answer, a better answer than me. Uh, to that question, the way I imagine it is that, is that what happens in the melt, the chains have all sorts of conformations and then straight segments randomly start pie stacking and, and probably that's a cooperative effect If someone straight, something else that's straight will, will couple to it and they form a little nucleus like that. Then growing in, in, the, in the third dimension is probably the most complicated thing because the side chains have to arrange the right way. So the way I imagine it is that a, a little, nucleus that has a few straight chains assemble like a deck of cards and then that drives the growth along the chain but i completely admit that that's very hand wavy and uh if there's polymer physicists in the audience i'm sure they can have a better answer to that question yeah i i also don't have you know a good answer for that roberto um so eric is also asking is there a is there uh, a no non way to turn the band gap into a pseudo uh, gap, like in quasi crystals, for instance? Uh, not that I know. Uh, control of the band gap right now it, it's still pretty. I would say uh, I wouldn't say uh, rudimentary, but the way people control it is conformation or structure of the monomer to just make it. Uh, uh, lower, for example, for solar cells, but I'm, I'm not aware of ways to control in a more sophisticated way. Right. Uh, and uh, Jose Neto, uh, Jose Abel Hoyos Neto, uh, he's asking, does stretching the polymer change mobility? Ah, very good question. Yes, absolutely. So that's part of why we're working with theorists is then to be able to predict all these effects. Yeah. Uh, what we found is uh, that um, when you go, actually, let me look at the, let me show you these correlations. So this map that I wasn't able to, um, to talk uh, about is a map of correlation versus distance and orientation. So the color means when you go from blue to red and black means more correlated. And then, so this essentially says, what are the chances that if I sit at a certain point, and I look at a certain distance, there is a chain that it has an angle of let's say 60 degrees with me. So I'm sitting here, what is the chance that further away I have a chance at 60 degrees, a chain at 60 degrees. So you can see now that because there is a lot of correlation at zero degrees, there is a chance all the way up to 400 nanometers that I have a chain, chain that has the same direction as me. So this would be like a stretched chain and you can see them here, right? It's these chains here that are, this is not a single chain. Remember, a single chain is much shorter. So this means that there is a high correlation or a high chance that for 400 nanometers, I can travel with the chain backbones all be in the same direction. And when you run the transport simulation, of course, this is good for transport because it means that you, if you go back to our transport model, if the chain is stretched, you're going along the chain direction fast for a long distance, let me go back to the transport model. So you can go here fast for a long distance, but it also means that if the chains are all in the same direction, I have a pretty good chance that near me, there's a chain that's oriented the same way, which means that I have a good overlap to hop to the other chain. So this is something that we wanna do now with Andy Spakowitz for the theory is to predict um, how much faster transport gets when you start stretching and orienting the chains all in the same direction. Experimentally, Alan Heger has shown that when you have these oriented films, mobility can go up by an order of magnitude or so, and they've had these incredible record-breaking mobilities with oriented films. Uh, 
Right, Alberto, I, I have just a final question and then uh, we can let you go for a break fast, I guess. Um, I'm having uh, my coffee. You know, this, say, say again? I'm having my coffee, as you can see. Okay, got, gotcha. <clears throat> so uh, I'm actually interested on this 4D um, STEM, mm -hmm. uh, scanning uh, transmission ele electron microscopy. Uh, and now it's a little bit of a specific question because um, uh, I'm curious. I'm always I've been always curious about uh, the microstructure of P dot PSS, right? It's mm -hmm. this well-known material. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, although people, you know, sort of suggest some 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 specific microstructure, you know, if you do X uh, uh, X ray diffraction, you don't quite see it. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, of course, because PSS is highly amorphous, but we know that uh, P dot itself does crystalline. Uh, my question is, uh, can we use, or are you guys using this 4D to sort of uh, map out uh, the real microstructure of P dot PSS? And could it be that uh, P dot really crystallizes, but the crystals are small uh, similar to the last polymer that you just uh, discussed it with us that actually has high mobility, but uh, initially everyone thought it would be amorphous because of the x-ray, but it mm -hmm. turns out that it is crystalline, but you know, the crystals are, are rather small. Can right. you comment on that and, and, and maybe, you know, just, just, just tell us some, some fresh results if you have it? Yeah, so yeah, we haven't done P.PSS. Um, it's probably challenging because it has a lot of amorphous PSS in there, but yeah, you, you, in principle, you would be able to see the P dot microcrystals. Um, the thing to keep in mind is, uh, let me show you the slide, even though it's not for the stem. Um, thing to keep in mind always is that with TM, you're looking through the whole film, right? So. If your film, you, I think it'd be a, a neat experiment, but you have to be careful about the thickness, right? You have to make it thin enough that you don't end up with a lot of crystals overlapping through the thickness, because then all you'll see is a contrast from all those crystals and it'll be hard to know. And you, you cannot back out on what plane they are. That information doesn't exist in, in TM. So if you make it very thin, that it's almost like a monolayer or, or a couple of layers, then yeah, you, you would be able to see it. I, I didn't think about it, but that would be a good um, experiment. It would probably take a little bit of uh, tuning to get the right uh, thickness and imaging conditions, but yeah, that could be definitely worth it. We haven't tried it. If you know someone uh, in, in your university or collaborating universities that has developed for this time, it would definitely be a neat, neat thing to try. Right, my, uh, Alberto, just the last question that I mm -hmm. my, was my bad, I lost it uh, from Florian. So he asked, uh, he ask, uh, you mentioned about the modeling of the transport within the amorphous phase where you had the inter and interchain charge transfer. Mm -hmm. How you determine the transfer rate? Oh the yeah, very good question. Um, so we got some rates from the literature, but um, I guess the, it, it's a, it, in fact, that's a weakness of, of that uh, model is that there's no good measurements of those that you can really trust. So we got some from the literature. People have done some spectroscopy experiments where they back out those transfer rates. Um, and then um, a lot of it is that the point is not to quantitatively uh, predict transport, but more to get a sense for the physical processes that govern transport. Uh, we have a collaboration with another colleague in chemical engineering who will try to determine those rates from first principles quantum mechanically. Hasn't really started because we haven't been able to get it funded yet. But right now, it's, I, I think the way I look at that model is it's a great way to get intuition, but it's not really meant to be predictive. Okay. Uh... I think we, we, we can finalize now, Alberto, after almost two hours. Uh, uh, let me open up my, my video here just so we can say goodbye. Um, you know, thank you a lot again for, for sharing with us all this amazing information and almost a lecture. 
you know, a lot of compliments on, on, on the YouTube video. So thank you again. And, uh, you know, it's always a pleasure to talk to you and listen to you. I always tell you, <clears throat> you're, uh, every lecture I go from you, I learn something and this time around wasn't different. So thank you very, very much. And I see some sunlights on your back. So I think yeah, the, the day right. started already. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, for, uh, thank you for having me. This was a pleasure. And I really hope to see you in person soon. Likewise, Alberto, likewise. Okay, so for the audience, this finalizes our, our colloquium today. Remembering that we are doing uh, one colloquium every two weeks. So we see you guys in two weeks. We are going to advertise everything uh, in time. Thank you so much and, and see you in two weeks. Bye-bye.